Hello everyone, welcome to the Getting a Product Theatre, where we will talk about neonatal ventilation topic. My name is Elena Komenko and I'm part of the global therapy development team in charge of ventilation. We are very happy to have you here and I'm sure we have a very interesting agenda for you. We will be talking to leading clinical professionals about the main trends in neonatal care, including NAVA. And our Getting It team will do some demos for you, uh, cover the latest evidence and scientific studies uh, when it comes to NAVA and how the Getting It high frequency oscillation ventilation works. At the end, there would be a possibility to ask a questions, so please use Q&A function of the chat, and we would try to cover as much as possible to reply to you. And with that, I'm heading over to our studio in Sweden. Thank you, Elena. It sounds like an interesting program. Yes, and we are very happy to show you interviews from neonatal experts from the UK and the US. Dr. Howard Stein is the medical director of the NICU at Ebbage Children's Hospital and professor of pediatrics at University of Toledo College of Medicine and Life Sciences in Ohio. Ms. Kimberly Firestone has Master of Science and a registered respiratory therapist. She is currently the neonatal respiratory outreach clinical liaison for the neonatal intensive care unit at Akron Children's Hospital. Both Kim and Dr. Stein are experts in neurally adjusted ventilatory assist, NAVA ventilation, and has worked extensively on research, proper operation, and management of NAVA and non-invasive NAVA in the neonatal population. They develop the current management strategies and guidelines for NAVA ventilation that are used by most neonatal intensive care providers around the world. Dr. Sandeep Shetty is a consultant neonatologist at St. George's Hospital and an honorary senior lecturer at St. George's University of London. His research interests include novel mode of invasive and non-invasive ventilatory support with focus on neurally adjusted ventilatory assist, NAVA. We ask our experts about their current ventilation strategies and their clinical practice guidelines in their neonatal ICU. Can you share your current ventilation guidelines and clinical practice in your NICU? Whenever a baby comes into our NICU, our thought is how can we protect these lungs short term? and therefore long-term. Our goal is to provide as much ventilation as they need um, at that particular time. So the strategy we use typically is NAVA ventilation because that allows the babies to pick how much ventilation they want on a breath-to-breath -breath basis. This is really personalized ventilation, which means that when the babies are experiencing atelectasis their CO2 starts to rise, their PO2 starts to fall, they need to recruit lung. And using NAVA ventilation, they are able to increase their respiratory drive as reflected by the electrical diaphragmatic activity. And therefore they get big breaths, which we consider as sigh breaths or recruiting breaths to then recruit the lung. Once they've recruited lung, they are then able in real time to drop back to just get the minimum amount of pressure they need to maintain ventilation. So then rather adjusting the ventilator from blood gas to blood gas, we take advantage of the fact that the baby's brainstem monitors blood on a moment to moment basis and adjust breath to breath to give the babies exactly what they need. We feel that this allows the babies to protect their lungs from excess over inflation from either pressure or volume. When we talk about lung protective strategy, it involves a lot of items. One of them being trying to keep positive pressure low. So trying to give the lowest heat pressures that you can give, give the lowest volumes that, that are needed. 
we want to ventilate that baby with the lowest amount of volume, pressure, inspiratory time, and oxygen that we can do. So a lot of times we call it gentle ventilation. Um, we may refer to it as um, in harmony with the patient, trying to get the ventilator to work with the patient. And sometimes in our conventional modes, we it, it's harder to do. So with Nava ventilation, we are able to obtain that much easier. We're able to give lower volumes, lower pressures, less FiO2 than we were with conventional ventilation. So all of those strategies help. And then what we need to do is wean quickly. The EDI catheter provides us with letting us know how the patient is reacting to the machine. Does he have enough um, energy or does he have enough strength as I'm weaning him? Is he able to keep up with it? And that's what's so fabulous, I think, about Nava ventilation is that we let him use that diaphragm. We let him work on strengthening his diaphragm. Because if you give a patient positive pressure over and over again, their, their, their diaphragm is not going to be working. But if you keep him exercising his diaphragm, we hope that he'll be able to get off the ventilator faster and then be able to proceed to non-invasive ventilation. Can you please share your current ventilator management for bronchopulmonary dysplasia and how you prevent it? So the bronchopulmonary dysplasia patient, the chronic lung disease patient, that is probably the most challenging patient to ventilate. And we have found by using NAVA here, and I'm only going to surmise that it's from the synchrony, they tolerate ventilation so much easier when they are on this compared to conventional ventilation. You can see that through their EDI signals, but you can see that also just by looking at them. And so sometimes some of our uh, providers here and some of our um, practitioners will say that this patient is addicted to NAVA, whereas I think this patient is addicted to the synchrony of a ventilator. And when he's able to get in synchrony with it, he's able to have less BPD spells. He's able to have lower oxygen concentration um, needs. And it, I, I really, and he still needs those high pressures because he has damaged lungs, but he's able to breathe easier on NAVA. And I know there's studies that are being formulated right now they're going to compare BPD settings, those um, long inspiratory times, high pressures, low rates, and compare patients that are using that to the patients then that will be put on NAVA and to see if there's a difference. So we don't have any literature or research right now to show that it makes a difference. I hope we will in the future, but our BPD patients on NAVA are definitely more comfortable and the, the people that um, give us the most feedback about that are their families. And they will say to us, he has less spells when he's on NAVA. He breathes easier when he's on NAVA. And I think with those things, we find out that even though that BPD patient is so difficult to ventilate, NAVA is usually a mode that we can use with them in terms of, uh, I initially started working on uh, NAVA mode of ventilation since 2013, more in research um, uh, context. And I was fortunate that at St. George's, I was able, uh, we were able to offer uh, NAVA mode, both invasive and non-invasive mode, as a, uh, as a standard of care for some of the complex patients. So invasive mode, we're really talking about infants who have been on the ventilator for beyond the three or four weeks, evolving or established uh, uh, bronchopulmonary dysplasia is still ventilated, then getting that synchrony. So we really published our, uh, 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 submitted our data to early human development uh, recently, uh, where we compared um, our uh, uh, 18 infant historical cohort, and we found that the 
duration of ventilation, uh, extubation failure rates are significantly uh, are lower in the uh, uh, NAVA group. And also the length of hospital stay was in, was in favor of uh, the, the NAVA group. Uh, so we've so far we've already done NAVA on at least um, you know, around 38 to 40 patients. Um, and um, uh, uh, and uh, the you know, staff and the neonatal unit are, uh, are getting more and more comfortable uh, offering this as a standard mode of care. The usual feedback is how comfortable the baby is. In fact, um, uh, you would ask, you, we sometimes uh, find other patients is, uh, asking us, when are you putting our baby onto NAVA? Uh, it's more about the comfort level, the synchrony, how, uh, the, how much you, know, you find that uh, uh, it's all contributing the overall um, uh, improvement uh, in how the baby is doing. Because we know that uh, it, it's not one standard pressure that is needed with breadth and breadth and and that facility of variation in uh, pressures, uh, helping with the breathing, uh, really uh, is a promising uh, aspect of uh, NAVA. So now, as you can see, we are now ventilating our baby on NAVA. The first thing you will see on NAVA is that once the patient is on NAVA, you will be able to drop the oxygen concentration, the lowest possible that is needed for the baby. And then you will see in here that the peak pressure that the baby is using is quite low and it's lung protective. You can also see that the patient is very comfortable with NAVA. You can monitor their respiratory rate, their tidal volume, and you will see in here that you have the EDI signal. You can monitor their EDI peak and their EDI mean. And that will tell you that the patient is uh, comfortable on the ventilator and how much work of breathing do they do less while on NAVA. Let's listen to Mirai talk about the clinical evidence for NAVA in the NICU. Um, hi everyone, my name is Mirai Shainikul and I'm uh, working as medical director at Yetinge, responsible for uh, product area critical care. Why EDI and NAVA? Uh, uh, basically, NAVA is a mode of ventilation uh, adapting ventilatory support to the patient's actual demand and overcome these uh, challenges. Uh, because the timing and the amount of ventilator assist is controlled by the patient's neural respiratory drive in NAVA. And uh, not just NAVA, but also the bedside monitoring of uh, EDI is a useful tool, tool for evaluating diaphragm function, respiratory, respiratory pattern, and central apnea, where uh, it can help the clinicians tailor caffeine treatment, sedation, kangaroo care, and the ideal resting positions. So we usually say the diaphragm is the heart of the respiratory system, and the EDI is the vital sign of respiration. So up to date, uh, there are more than 300 publications have described the signs of NAVA and EDI monitoring uh, since the FDA approval of NAVA in 2007. And these uh, studies uh, um, focusing mainly on five areas, uh, synchrony, improved synchrony, work of breathing, and uh, protective tidal volumes, inspiratory pressures, better gas exchange, sedation need, uh, and comfort. And uh, if we look at uh, a systematic uh, review by Jennifer Beck, uh, you can see that uh, synchrony is improved significantly with the NAVA compared to conventional mechanical ventilation modes. Uh, in this systematic review uh, from 2015, uh, they have looked at 15 published articles uh, and totally uh, 203 neonatal and pediatric patients were evaluated. And uh, asynchrony, was, um, uh, asynchrony was between 12 to 40% in conventional modes and 0 to 11% in NAVA. So, yes, asynchrony... Uh, is, uh, is very important, uh, but why do we care so much? 
because we know that the new failure requiring intubation occurs in 19 to 45 percent of children and is associated with a prolonged length of stay. So patient ventilator synchronization is uh, critical to reduce the work of breathing and to achieve successful uh, non-invasive ventilation. So this is where we believe uh, where we believe and the articles also show that uh, NAVA can make a difference. Uh, there is a randomized control trial from uh, Finland by uh, Kallio and her team. Uh, so they had uh, 170 pediatric and neonatal patients in this trial uh, and they compared the conventional ventilation versus NAVA. Uh, primary endpoints of the study were uh, time on ventilator and the amount of sedation needed. And this study uh, showed uh, basically uh, that uh, peak inspiratory pressures were statistically lower in the NAVA group. Uh, basically more uh, prone to protective lung ventilation. And the median duration of invasive ventilation uh, was uh, uh, much uh, lower in the NAVA group, as well as the length of stay in the ICU and uh, sedation. Sedation use tended to be lower in the NAVA group, a trend uh, which was significant, especially when, uh, when post-op patients were excluded. Um, and also they could sh uh, clearly show that uh, it was the much more ineffective efforts seen in the conventional mechanical ventilation. Um, and now, uh, af since uh, after so many articles since 2007, so many studies show that uh, NABA improves the synchrony and keep the diaphragm active. And uh, this also can avoid atrophy, which uh, diaphragm atrophy, which may cause prolonged weaning. So now we are not only talking about actually lung protective ventilation, but also we know the importance of uh, keeping the diaphragm active. Uh, so diaphragm protective ventilation is uh, also very as important as lung protective ventilation. Summarize uh, the benefits of NAVA. Uh, we now know that uh, with the improved synchrony uh, uh, in NAVA is, uh, um, can also help basically uh, help the patients uh, avoid fighting with the ventilator and protecting the lungs, diaphragm and also the brain with, uh, with, uh, by improving comfort and uh, less sedation. And uh, this help neonates breed, sleep, and, uh, and grow. We have already heard a lot of interesting things today about NAVA, this mode of ventilation which is unique for the servo ventilators. But as you know, HFO ventilation is also very important in the NICU. So I would like to ask Edita, can you give us a demo of the HFO functionality as well? Absolutely, Caroline. So, for many of you who have used the servo ventilators, we all know that it's well known for being very user-friendly and very intuitive. So, the same thing here applies for our servo N high-frequency oscillator. So, let me show you here how you use the servo N high-frequency oscillator. So, here on the servo N, we have two modes of ventilation. We have high-frequency oscillator, which is amplitude control, and we have high-frequency oscillation, volume target ventilation for better control of carbon dioxide because we know that during high-frequency oscillator, it is very important that we control the target carbon dioxide for our babies. How we set the high-frequency here? So when you tap on the mode, uh, we have a contextual help here that can help you um, to know all the information about different modes and parameters. And then from here, you can actually set the mode. So you, as you see here in the uh, screen, you can set the different parameters of high frequency, the oxygen concentration, the P-min, the amplitude, the frequency, and the IE ratio. So let's take a look on how we set the pressure amplitude here. So in our scale here, we have a guide of what is your goal when you're doing high-frequency oscillation. 
So if you want to increase the ventilation, for example, you can press on the plus sign here and you can increase the amplitude. Or if, you want, if your goal is to decrease ventilation, you can press the negative um, sign in here and you can decrease the amplitude. And once you're done, you can confirm here and that your settings now are set. You can now accept and then you are on high-frequency oscillatory ventilation on the servo end. So I think I know what HFO ventilation is. So it's giving very small tidal volumes, but at very high frequencies. So in that way to really gently ventilate the patient. But what I'm struggling with is, is to understand really how does it exactly work? And especially, how does it work so well in the servo N ventilator? So I'm very happy we have the ideal person with us here today to answer that question, namely Anders Salin, who has spent 25 years of his uh, working life in development of ventilators, including the servo N and including HFO functionality. So welcome, Anders. Thank you, Caroline. Let's talk a little bit about servo N HFO then. Each HFO cycle consists of an inspiratory phase pushing gas into the lung and pull phase pulling gas out of the lungs. The tricky thing in HFO is to achieve the pull effect. And here is how Serwen does this. It starts with the HFO push phase where we have the inspiratory valves that creates an HFO flow pulse pushing gas into the circuit and into the lungs. Then when the amplitude within the circuit is about to reach its maximum pressure, we open the expiratory valve, thereby allowing the HFO flow pass to pass through the circuit. Now we have a lot of gas in motion through the circuit. Then the machine quickly decreases flow pulse and thereby creates a subatmospheric pressure. But the flow pass is still moving out of the machine. And this is how we create the so-called pull effect. So to me, it sounds a little bit like, like a slipstream. It is like a slipstream. We can compare it with a race car and the race car is pushing the gas or the air in front of it and thereby creates a sub-atmospheric pressure area behind it. Okay. So I think I, I, you're explaining it really well. I think I understand how it works now, but uh, it sounds like it must have been very difficult to achieve all this, you know, to, to achieve this sort of ideal synchronization between the inspiratory and the expiratory valves and the, the ideal pulsation. It took a lot of time and effort to optimize the synchrony between the inspiratory part and the expiratory part. I would say that the secret behind the servo N HFO power lies within its powerful and accurate HFO pulses and this perfect synchrony between these pulses and the expiratory valve. Okay, so then what is then the result for the patients? That must lead then to the, the, the low work of breathing, um, breathing that we see in, in spontaneously uh, breathing patients, like in the Remusberger study from 2018. Yes, you can check it out at our virtual booth. 